you know, I started this because I wanted to simply travel. I have no bigger goal than that. I wanted to earn enough money to get me a plane ticket to my next destination. And then I'd figure it out. What would the world look like if people felt like they mattered? Welcome to the Lead with Love podcast, exploring what it means to lead with love in business and life. I'm your host, Jada Selner, and in this show, I'll share meaningful conversations to help you, the creative, the entrepreneur, the world changer, reach more people, go after your dreams, and serve your community with love. I appreciate you joining me. Now, let's get cozy and start today's episode. So often we get caught up in worrying about tomorrow that we don't give ourselves the opportunity to live today. We're going to explore the heart of wanderlust and what it means to build an accidental business around a desire to travel the world. In today's conversation, I get cozy with New York Times bestselling author, Matthew Kepnes. Now, Matt runs the award-winning budget travel site, nomadicmat.com. He's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, How to Travel the World on $50 a Day, as well as the upcoming travel memoir, 10 Years a Nomad. His writings and advice have been featured in the New York Times, CNN, Budget Travel, Time, and many, many more. He also regularly speaks at travel, trade, and consumer shows, owns a hostel in Texas, and launched a nonprofit called Flight, which empowers students from underserved communities through transformative travel experiences. Matt is super cool, and in just a second, you'll get to hear what part of the world he's in right now. So let's get cozy with Matt. Hey, hey, Matt. Hey. (laughs) So I just asked you before we started recording where in the world you are, and you have to tell me again. I am in Verona, Italy. Verona, Italy, which is the Romeo and Juliet <laughs> location, right? That Verona, Italy, yes. That's amazing. And for people who don't know you, and you know, you're a nomadic Matt. And I was talking to my husband earlier before preparing for this conversation. And I was like, do you have any questions about travel? And he's like, Matt, he's like, like Uncle Traveling Matt from the Fraggle Rocks. He's like, ask him if he knows who that is. And then I go to your Twitter, which has over 100,000 followers, and that's your profile picture. <laughs> yeah, so I do know who Uncle Traveling Matt is. Oh, he's, he's the only Fraggle to have ever left Fraggle Rock. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And I'm sure with all the different countries that you've been to, how many countries has it been now? I don't really keep track, but I would say around a hundred ish, maybe a little more. Yeah. I'm not a country counter. Cool. I love that. Which is very, for me, when I talk about love over metrics, it's just like, you don't have to track all the stats, all the numbers. You can just live life and, and do business in a good way. So, and how we, you know, originally met, I know we met briefly at Jason Gaynard's mastermind talks in Carmel, California. And you recently invited me to speak at TravelCon in Boston this year, which I'm excited to talk more about as we dive into the conversation. But you've got some amazing keynote speakers that will be there this year. Cheryl Strayed, the author of Wild, Mark Mason, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Like you really attract some amazing people into your world. So before we dive into that, and and for anyone who's like, yes, I want to see those people speak, should definitely go to travelcon.org and Matt I believe that officially travelcon to attend in person is sold out is that correct that is correct yes we sold out a couple of weeks ago congratulations that's amazing so before we dive in deeper into this conversation I have to ask you Matt what does leading with love mean to you and how do you put love into practice in your business Mm, That's a good question. I guess leading with love. I mean, for me, you know, they they have that book, The Five Love Languages or whatever. And I think my love language is service. So I think for me, like, 
leading with love is about serving people in a way that betters their life, you know, like doing things for people just because of the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, not because you get any, you get any gain out of it. Right. You just, it's a thing you should do. So like, you know, in our business, we just create content and products and events that help people travel better. And we ensure that what we do is honest and is going to be the thing that they do when they travel. So we don't take a lot of sponsored content or go on these like crazy press trips or whatever, you know, like all the Instagram influencers out there and doing things that the average person can do because that's really not serving them. That's not going to help them see the world because that's not an experience they can replicate. Mm. And you mentioned, I love the five love languages. My, my love language is quality time. And I love that you express your love language in your business. Can you give me a, a specific example of when you did something for someone without expecting anything in return? I cut two days ago um, <laughs> when my friend was asking about business coaches and I just said, you should meet my friend Clay, our friend Clay, you know, Clay Bear. And I was like, he could really help you out, you know? And so I just planned, actually they're both via TravelCon. So I will connect them there and I don't expect it, You know, my friend to be like, thank you so much. Here's, you know, a Taylor Swift ticket and, or Clay to be like, here's a, re like, here's, a percentage just like you need help clay is good at giving help there you go yeah and clay is one of the smartest business people that i know and i'm so excited to see him in boston too yeah he's awesome i know that you finished an mba before starting your life of travel and i'm just curious what is your relationship with education and and having that MBA or those, those three letters in your wheelhouse? I personally thought it was a waste of money. And if anybody listening would like to buy it, I will sell my <laughs> MBA really, really cheap. I'm still paying off the debt. I think I'm down to like 17,000. So I'll sell it for 17,000. <laughs> um, you know, it costs, costs like 60. So it's a bargain. I think, you know, people go to business school because you're just supposed to go to business school, right? You know, you get a job, you want to do, cor you want to advance in the corporate world. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to get an MBA and then it makes you more employable because you've supposedly learned all these things that make you smarter and more equipped to handle better, tougher decisions. I hated the degree. <laughs> I think it really, like, you don't buy that. You can't, you can't buy that. MBAs are good because you buy the connection. So maybe if I had stayed in Boston and went into the corporate world that that alumni connection could have been much more useful, but it didn't. So it's not useful at all. I think continuing education is important. You know, I attend masterminds. We met at one. I'm always reading. I'm always learning. I listen to podcasts. I, I love masterclass that online. Oh yes. Oh my God. I belong to every masterclass. I gift them out all the year. I mean, I'm obsessed with that. So for me, like education is not something that you go to school and then you're done. It's something that must happen continuously. Yeah. And I, I recently started homeschooling my daughter this year. She's in sixth grade and yeah, we signed up for master class and she was watching Judy Bloom. You know, she loves writing and reading fiction. Do you have a favorite master class that you've either recently done or you're like, oh my goodness, everyone needs to take this class or this was so helpful for me. I'm so bad at master class as much as I love it. Cause like I start them and then I get halfway through them and then I just, I love that they have the mobile app now. Cause I actually do watch a lot of them on the phone. I loved Judy Blooms. I thought that was really interesting about how she creates characters. I found that aspect of it really interesting. I really liked Aaron Sorkin's um, because I liked his, his process on, so there's always an, an object for the character and then an obstacle. And so when I was writing my upcoming book, I always thought like, okay, what's the obstacle? You know, 
there's always has to be an, an arc. I love the food ones. Gordon Ramsay's was awesome. I make his eggs all the time. So I'm really am a big fan of Gordon Ramsay's eggs. Uh, <laughs> I was a huge fan of, who else was it? I always get her name wrong. Diane von Furstenberg or whatever her name is. Uh, right. I can't think of it either. (laughs) Yeah, she's a fashion um, mogul. So listen to her talk about building a brand around an individual, which something relates perfectly to me. I liked, you know, I I really like the chess one, you know, uh, Gary Kasparov, just because I I find that interesting. So I I love the space one too, because I find space interesting. I, I like them all. Yeah, what I love is just hearing the variety of teachers and categories that you're studying, which is so cool. You're also a Gemini too, right? Yeah. And I'm a Gemini as well. So I love that you like, you're like, I don't finish all of them. Like you just get the little bit that you need and, and you run with that and you let that inspiration soak up for you because I think it's important for people to hear that you can still build a beautiful life, have a successful business and not follow through on everything. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Aaron Sorkin one was just out of interest. I'm not going to be a a screenwriter. And so when they do like this long workshops where they like really go through the scenes, like "Eh, not really relevant to me. I, I, I want more of the big picture stuff. Same with Diane von Furstenberg's. I listened to the ones where she talked about her story and some of the marketing techniques, but they also do specific case studies where and they take somebody and she sort of like walks them through and mentors them. Not really relevant. So yeah. I'm like, skip, 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 skip. <laughs> That's awesome. And building the brand around you, that part piqued my ears. What were some of the strategies that you have implemented into your own business and, and brand? You know, I think it's really important when you're building a brand around yourself is to always remember that nobody cares about you. Everyone is dealing with their own day-to-day shit and stresses. Can I say that? Yes, you can. (laughs) Okay, Okay, I mean, don't know what PG rating this is. You know, so you must create something, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the service, is you must create something that also adds value to somebody's life. Voyeurism will only go so far. You remember, um, this is like beginning internet, like 2008, stuff white people say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> God, that was so funny, you know? And then they had like stuff Chinese people say, stuff black people say, stuff Jewish people say, stuff Hispanic people say, stuff gay people. And like everyone just sort of created their own little spinoff about it. And it was really funny and, you know, they made a book and now it just kind of went away because it was like this funny voyeuristic kind of thing and then it's gone. You know, shit my dad says, you know, here we are like following this guy's Twitter about the random stuff his dad says. And then we moved on because where is the intrinsic value there, right? How does that make that reader's life better? And so I always think like as much as people want to follow you and be inspired by you, they must also find value because voyeurism only goes so far. So whenever um, I'm thinking about, you know, a new product or anything and something that, you know, people are going for nomadic mat. I also always think about how is it going to help somebody? Because that's, what's going to, you know, that's why 10 years later, people still follow my website. That's why, you know, 15 years later, Tim Ferriss is still the big name he is, you know, because he, you know, he always morphed, but he's very into like, what can I do for, for you? You know, regardless of what anyone thinks of him, because I know he's kind of a polarizing figure, I think he also is an example of that. Like Marie Forleo is another one. You know, they've built brands around themselves, but it's not really about them. I love that example. It also takes the attention off of you because I know even for me, transitioning from simple green smoothies, kind of building a business around an idea, a brand, felt so much easier than like jadaselner.com where it just feels like ah like I don't want all the attention on me and I love that it's like you can still build something around you but just take the attention off of you and put it back on how you you can make this person's life better right because at the end of the day you know people 
are dealing with their own problems. And so they, they want you to help them. They can be inspired by you, but if, if it's all like, look at me traveling the world and doing cool things and not, you know, just hashtag, you know, best life <laughs> or like, well, you know what, like my car broke down today and, you know, hashtag best life that, you know, and people just don't, we'll move on. So what would be an example of a post? Cause you know, you have over a hundred thousand followers on nomadic Matt on Instagram as well. And your pictures are beautiful, really cool places that you're traveling to. What's an example of you posting a photo that's in a really cool, inspiring place and also being helpful for others that it's not just about, look, I'm in Verona, Italy, but what is an example of you actually implementing that strategy of being of service? Uh, We always try to have good information in like the quote. So it's just not like, here I am, but like, a good photo plus some facts. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago by now, I was in Jordan, went to Petra, and, you know, all the updates about Petra had information about the kingdom that used to be there, how they made the buildings into the stone. I was actually fascinated by how they became master at water resources and, like, building pipes and sewers and reservoirs. So, like, include all that there. So so it's just not like, hey, it's me. (laughs) Like, here's like about the place. Same thing when I went to Juresh. It had a whole thing about uh, the ancient Roman city that's in Jordan too. And even if I'm not including a a historical thing, I like to just include something about some reflective caption that captures an emotion because at the end of the day, that's how people connect with each other on an emotional level right? Nobody can replicate my experience here in Girona because it's my experience. You can't, unless you're me, you can't do it. So whatever story I tell is kind of useless. If it's just like, I did this and then I went to eat and then I did that. That's a diary entry. But if I talk about the feelings and you know, the thoughts and observations, that's going to recall a similar memory or a similar emotion that people can relate to. And so we always try to call that out, you know, in some way. So it's just not a photo of like, here I am at the beach, you know, here I am at the beach relaxing because of insert, you know, observation. Yeah. And I'm curious, and I just want to rewind a little bit, you know, you got the MBA, but you had a trip in Thailand in 2005, which is kind of the cornerstone moment for you in building this whole body of work and and traveling the world and inspiring others to do it. What was the moment when you decided to release the typical traditional milestones of, you know, having the car and the mortgage and the MBA and, you know, all of those pieces? When was that moment that you made the decision to release that and go in another direction? Well, I generally took this journey sort of accidentally. I had finished the MBA. I had, I knew I wasn't going to continue working in healthcare, which was like my nine to five job before I did all this. And so I thought the MBA is done. I'm going to look for a new job. Why not take this year long trip as sort of a nice, you know, bookend to one chapter and the beginning of another. And then I'll come back and get a job and, you know, like, picket fence and the house with the two cars and my 2.5 kids and all that jazz. But life has a funny way of changing on those plans. And so I just took the trip and then I just kept taking it. And then, (laughs) you know, I came back home 18 months later, sat back down in the cubicle during a temp job while I quote unquote searched for work, didn't really search for anything. And then realized, like, this is not the life I want to go back to. I still want to travel. I'm I'm not ready to come home yet. And I went back out. I I moved back to Bangkok, and I taught English. I worked on this blog on the side. And it was just sort of like, you know, you wake up, and, like, 10 years have gone by. And you're like, well, I guess I found my career. (laughs) (laughs) Did your family or friends have any comments, responses to you when you – made that decision to extend the year long trip turned into a decade. (laughs) 
I mean, my parents thought I was crazy up until I started earning money. Um, and they're like, well, you should still get a real job. What's this whole working on my thing? That's not going to last. Uh, and then when my first book came out and there was a book, you're like, oh, okay, maybe you're, maybe you have something going on, but are you saving, you know, I, saving money? I remember watching TV with my mom. It's like, you should really put more money away because one day you're going to get old and you're going to need to retire and then you can go travel. And she like cut herself off. She's like, oh, I guess you already travel now. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag best life. She's like, well, you should still save money for a rainy day. And I was like, yeah, don't worry, mom. But my friends, you know, it was indifference. You know, how do you explain to somebody your life? You know, how's it going? Good. You know, like, what'd you do the last year? Stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, how do you explain every moment, you know, every weird bus ride or every every weird food you had, all the waterfalls you saw and cliffs you jumped off of and people you met and like to don parties on beaches you went to. And so when I came back, they were just like, oh, you know, cool. Seems like you had fun. And then when I went away, they're like, okay. Uh, don't really know what to say to it. And my old coworkers thought I was still crazy because, you know, here I was, you know, still not following the path that society has laid out for me. I still had student loans to pay off. You know, the world was a dangerous place. It's you know, so crazy to do this. You know? They thought that was nuts. Yeah, and obviously it helps to generate the revenue, have the books in place. Were there any doubts or fears that you personally had as you decided to continue on that path of traveling and figuring out how to make money online. It was all sort of an accident. You know, I started this because I wanted to simply travel. I had no bigger goal than that. I wanted to earn enough money to get me a plane ticket to the next destination. And then I'd figure it out. And so one day once I just started making money, I was like, Oh wow, this might be a thing. Let me go into it. And so I didn't really have any fears or self doubts in the beginning because I had no intention. It wasn't like, Hey, I'm going to do this thing. And you know, Oh my God, if it fails, what am I going to do? It was just sort of something I did on the side to make money. But when it became my full-time job, it became like the thing I did. Then it's always like, Oh my God, what happens when, you know, this product launch fails. Oh my God, we launched something and nobody bought it. It's been five seconds for a failure. You know, I know my team will be like, chill. It takes, you know, people just reading their email now. It's like, no, it's been an hour. You know, we haven't made a hundred thousand dollars. This product launch is a failure. That's it. We're done. And then, you know, the day goes by and a couple of days go by and, you know, people start opening their email and getting it. And then you realize like, wait, you know, when I get these kind of emails, I read it and then forget about it until the second or third email, you know, until it's like the very end because people procrastinate and I procrastinate, but you never think of that when you're on the other side. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at TravelCon. I was worried up until the very end that we were going to not sell out. <laughs> like totally freaking out about hitting our numbers and oh my God. And then like the last week, when we would start telling people like we only have a handful of tickets left, we just like sold them all in like a day. Like something magical happened after Memorial Day and it was just like boom. All right, we're done. It's like, oh, all right, I guess this worked out. And now people are still trying to buy tickets and they can't. And I'm just like, oh okay, I, I gotta learn to relax a bit more. Right. I think fear and self doubt are with you forever. I don't think anyone I know who owns a business or you know or is in any executive level position goes through the day without worrying about making a mistake. I and think you know, it's just the thing. Yeah. You know what I love about that is that when the stakes were so much lower that there actually wasn't any doubt and fear, you were just clear, I want to get a flight <laughs> to the next location. And then when it starts to become your 
source of how you make a living that the doubts and fear and we put bigger and bigger projects out in the world and, and we're on the line for more that it can actually increase because what we think is oh once I make you know that six figures that seven figures then I'll be able to chill out and relax and be peaceful about it and it's just not how it works yeah yeah especially when you get employees because you know if I fail whatever you know, I, I always say, like, I'll just move back to Thailand and teach English again. But, you know, I have full-time employees with children, and that's not a solution for them. So, you know, you, you start looking at numbers and how do you hit payroll and how do you get all these, like, targets and yeah. who's up at night. <laughs> um, you know, because it's not just you anymore. Yeah. You're responsible for other people. So I want you to tell me about what your team looks like today. And then I want to rewind back to that first dollar that you made online. But first, tell me who is your support team for making your blog and your business move forward? I have a research assistant, a full-time tech person, a community manager, and a social media manager. Uh, somebody who does all our social and Facebook ads. And then I'm looking to hire a few more people later on in the year. Awesome. Who are those people? Just so I always like to like have that seed planted. If anyone's like, oh my goodness, this would be the perfect place for me to be. Another research assistant because we have so much content and travel. You always need to keep updating it. And then a second writer for the website. And what do you have a research assistant do? Because I'm like, ooh, that first when I've built businesses, that's one role that I've never hired. And I feel like, you know, being an author and creating content that it feels like a really important person to have on your team. So you normally the research assistant, when I'm writing a new post, you know, I'll write something and I'll have heard of something, you know, this castle was built in X and they will fill in the X. They'll double check prices, double check spelling of, of names and places, make sure I get those right, dates, facts, figures. If I want to cite some data, they'll go find that data. You, know, you hear a lot of hearsay, like, you know, I was just in Colombia, and it's like, oh, it's much safer than it was 10 years ago. Well, everyone told me that, and I kind of know that to be true through listening to stories from people. But having hard facts is another thing. So we went and looked up crime stats. And it is true that on the aggregate, Columbia is much safer than 10 years ago. So we got those stats. You know, tourism numbers have grown. Okay, well, let's get the exact numbers. And then we have a lot of old content. So she also like, and part of her role is to just go back through old content and, you know, update links and, you know, if a restaurant has gone out of business, take it down. If prices have changed, change that. That's cool. I love just like having this detail-oriented person looking over all the things. And I know now this accidental <laughs> blog and business, you know, started as a, just a desire to travel. You have grown it to six figures, multiple six figures, and now seven figures. And so I just want to rewind to that first money that you made online and what that was like for you. Yeah, when I first started making money, it was through text link sales. Those were you know, back 2008, I guess. <laughs> um, when I started this whole thing is, Companies would pay you to put links on your website because links, you know, allowed you to rank higher in Google. So everyone just bought links. And so people would buy links and I would be like, oh, sure, buy some links. That's okay. Let's, you know, buy some quote unquote ads, as people called it, not really ads. Because nobody actually was cared if anyone clicked on the link. It was just for Google to see. So I remember I sold like six or seven. <laughs> they would go on my sidebar uh, for like, a thousand bucks. And I was like, holy moly, a thousand bucks. That's, that's a month in Asia. It's not more. You know, so I was like, I'm going to sell some more of these. And I used to have this like giant list of, you know, hundreds of names that I would like contact. You're like, hey, you want to buy some more links? And then I really started getting into like really niche websites. So I once created a website about how to train a beagle because <laughs> it had 
had really good Google ads and CPAs. So, you know, I started experimenting that way and I just eventually brought it all back to the site and then just focused on affiliates and my own products. But yeah, like that first thousand buck sale, I was like, Ooh, wait a minute. Like there's actually some real money to be made for this. Was there any book that you were reading at the time or where were you getting most of your inspiration to go from, you know, the a thousand dollar pay for links to like building it into a full-time income? I used to have these like marketing websites blogs I followed who made all those like spammy websites. <laughs> and they were making like 30, 40 grand a month. And I was like, teach me. So I was following all these blogs that you know, we're making like thirty, forty thousand dollars a month having all these niche websites. I mean, it was spammy, but you know, back then I was twenty six, and I was like, I just saw forty thousand dollars a month. So I followed them a lot, and I had these two guys who taught me SEO, and they were the ones that pushed me back into Nomadic Matt. They're like, Why are you building all these stupid websites? You have a blog that people read, real people read, not just like random Google traffic. They follow you. They're a real audience. Stop wasting your time on these stupid little websites. Focus on Nomadic Matt. And I was like, yeah, you're right. So that's when I moved back into Nomadic Matt, but I took what I learned from them about SEO and used it to like write really good articles about travel because I knew what people wanted because they were asking me all the time. And that ranks really high in Google. So I followed them for a while. And then when I really got into blogging, blogging itself. I follow Darren Rouse from ProBlogger. Yeah. He always had top information. And so Chris Gilbao, another mutual friend of ours. So then I started looking more into bloggers and away from the marketers. And I was like, ooh, Ramit Sadie. He was another one I followed a lot. And I know, do you feel, you know, it's been over a decade and the blogging world has changed and where people's eyeballs and attention are, have shifted. How have you navigated that shift or have you felt like you've still stayed really strong in the blogging arena? So I think content is still king. You know, quality content has always mattered. But back in the day, you know, people had a blog and you had RSS feed and you subscribed to that feed and people commented and actually read blogs. And then Twitter came along and there was some stuff on YouTube and then you had Facebook pages, but now you have Snapchat and Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook groups and who knows what other social media apps are out there these days that I don't even know about. And so people's attention has become really fractured. You know, nobody has RSS. And so I think what's really changed is that you have to be more places and sort of try to drive as much traffic to one platform as possible. Instagram and such is really great for being inspired, but then people have a question and they want to go to Google. So I think having more than anything, a strong Google presence is important. The downside to that is people have really low brand affiliation. You know, they might find you through Google, but I mean, Nomadic Map versus another travel website is just two travel websites. So they don't know the way they used to know for, you know, that blogger, this blogger. And so I think you still have to be on every platform, uh, which can kind of get annoying. Social media is great for brand awareness, but the conversion is really in the email list and in search. So I think that is, is really a big shift. And it's become so popular because, you know, everyone's like, ooh, I want to make money and travel. And there's no barrier to entry that everybody's trying to, like, get online these days. It's not a weird social stigma anymore to say I'm an Instagram or I'm a vlogger, I'm a blogger, you know, where like in 2008, it was like, you do what online? Like, <laughs> when you, I don't get what that is. How do you make money? No, I, I do this thing and then people read it and yeah. And then people buy products, but how, like, are you, are you sending them a backpack? You know, what's an affiliate program? And so I think that that's sort of the big shift. It's sort of the fracturization of the internet. And what do you feel that you are doing specifically within your company? It sounds like you're saying content is still important to have that 
you know, what questions people are searching to have a presence on social media to build that relationship and that brand and also to get people to opt into your email list where that's where the conversions and sales would happen. Is that right? Yeah. You know, I, I think Facebook's pretty useless these days because you have such a low organic reach on your pages that, you know, and, and people's feeds are so cluttered and people are just tired of Facebook that that's not really the best place to be. I love Twitter as just a way to like talk in real time and then Instagram. I think are really the two best places for brand awareness. YouTube, if you love video, I don't, I'm a writer. I hate being on camera. Just stick me behind the screen typing. Right. Um, so maybe YouTube also. Pinterest is a great source for traffic, especially in travel because it's a highly visual thing. So people really dig that. Cooking is another great place for Pinterest. Anything where that looks good in pictures yeah. uh, is great for Pinterest. I love yeah, that so. you're sharing that just to show up on platforms also where you shine the most. And so for you, it's like writing is it's great for me. For me, it's like using my voice. So it's like having a podcast, you know, like figuring out where those places where you can show up and be excited, but also making sure your people are still there too. Exactly. I mean, there's no point in being on a medium that you don't like because people are going to realize really quickly you hate to be there and it's not going to be fun and happy. And then they're not going to want to, follow you because you're just a sad panda (laughs) hey guys follow my youtube channel isn't it so exciting to watch me on camera no no it's not so we're not gonna do that anymore (laughs) and you wrote a new book which i'm so excited about called 10 years a nomad a traveler's journey home which comes out this summer and I'm curious, what's been exciting and challenging about writing your second book? Because you have a New York Times bestseller, How to Travel the World on $50 a Day. And I'll link to both of these books as well as Travel Con in the show notes. How would you compare, you know, your writing process from the first book to the second book? The first book was actually really easy to write. And I say that not to sound pretentious, <laughs> but I say that because it was a guide and it's very straightforward. Do this. Don't do that. Spend money here. Get this card to save money. You know, get this kind of backpack. Make sure you pack this. You know, it's very matter of fact. I mean, it required a lot of research, you know, because you have to have the facts and figures to, and prices and that data to back up what you're saying. But essentially, I just, I just wrote a guidebook. You know, and it's, it's tedious and well, I guess, it's, well, it's just really tedious, but there's no emotion in it, right? I mean, you got to keep it interesting so people can read it and you want to have some funny stories there, but it's not a novel. It's a guidebook. The second one, oh my God, that was excruciating. You know, I wanted to just take it outside and beat it to death every other day. I wanted to throw my computer out the window every day. You know, it, yes. Yes, yeah, I'll take the computer and just beat it. To, like, I wanted to take a copy of my manuscript into a field and just like hit it with a hammer you know, or a baseball bat all the time. And, you know, because it's writing a story that is, this is a story that has a narrative arc, interesting characters, you know, keeps people's attention for 300 pages. That's a lot of work. You gotta have emotion and dialogue, and it can't be boring dialogue. It has to be something that makes sense and it has to be realistic and you know i'm trying to remember conversations i had 10 years ago and you know would somebody say that in real life you know so you you have to have it all that that way and you know it's it's a real challenge it took many many edits and many many years to do so it's definitely the hardest thing i ever wrote and so it's like night and day that was when I really felt like, oh my God, I'm a writer and I'm writing a book and I understand why everybody just agonizes over writing, especially writing a story because it is, it's difficult. Yeah. And I love the comparison because I'm thinking about 
the simple green smoothies book that I wrote. And it, it's a more like, here's the recipes, here's the photos, <laughs> drink it. And now I'm writing my second book and it's more of my last 10 years of being an entrepreneur and a mom without a college degree and being a woman of color and not seeing representation and just, it's just helpful. Your, <laughs> the challenge for you, I'm like, okay, good. I'm on the right track. <laughs> it was very helpful to see that. Did you know when you chose to write this book Book, that it was going to be this challenging? No, I didn't. I just thought, okay, I'll write a story. I mean, you know, it's my life, right? So I know my life. And luckily I had 10 years of blogs to sort of use as the framework. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I have to remember things. I could just kind of scroll back into the website and be like, okay, I remember this. I'll take this and I'll expand on this and I'll grab this and I'll expand on that. And so I just wrote it, you know, A to B to Z happened. And people are like, no, it's boring. You know, and then you're reading it like, yeah, it is kind of boring. <laughs> uh, because you got to create action, you know. I thought it's French called the donnement or, you know, where, you know, where the story builds up to a critical moment and then, then it like winds down. And, and so the challenge is really making it interesting. And I think... You know, I lucked out in the sense that I, I had all this content from my blog, but it's, I didn't think it would be so hard because I had all the content. I was like, oh, I'll just write the story. And then you're like, no, nope, that was terrible. Okay, let me try this again. Nope, that was also even more terrible. And then you're like, okay, I kind of like it. I don't want to like, you know, burn the whole manuscript now. Let's give it to some people. And then they're like, nope, that's still terrible. And you're like, no, damn it. <laughs> and then you try again. And then eventually the stars align. And they always say, oh, well, you know, uh, Jack Kerouac wrote On the Road in One Sitting. But they always leave off the fact that he spent two years editing that book. And mm -hmm. it's really, the story I actually found the easiest part, it was the editing and making the story interesting to someone other than yourself. Yeah. Did you have any habits or rituals that you had in place or like your process of actually, you know, you, you gathered the blog post, but how did you actually like sit down and write? Were you in a Google doc? What was, were you posting blog posts on your wall? Like, what was that process? I just, I write in Microsoft Word. I've been doing that since I was 12 <laughs> you know, when I came out. So like, I'm really used to that program and I don't, it probably will never change. But after I, the first goal was to just to write the whole thing linearly. And then I actually, like, I have a WeWork co-working space. So I went into one of the conference rooms one day and basically, like, outlined the story the way, like, they do in TV, like, storyboarding it. And then, like, sort of shifting everything around to sort of, you know, so there was, like, time jumps where it would be, like, okay, here's this, what happens, and we'll jump forward, then we'll jump back, then we'll jump forward, and then shifting around things thematically and then filling in the holes. So I w one of the things that I think was really important for me is I like to print everything. I mean, I probably killed a forest during this process <laughs> because I would print out everything, and then I would edit it that way. So I would write you know, a couple of chapters, and I'd leave notes along the way, and I would go back and fill in those notes, and then I would print them out. And I would line that in and I would make notes like, oh, I should really expand this, expand that, you know, get the name of that thing that happened that one time, you know, from Billy, you know, and he'll remember. So write all these little notes and then type them in there and get, you know, the name of that place that I don't remember, but Billy does. And then fill in that and keep moving on in sections. I usually do like two or three chapters at a time. Yeah. Were there any humans <laughs> that supported you in getting this book to print? You know, were there, was there anyone in your corner or were you just lone wolfing it? Well, you know, I have a, a lovely agent who's there for me. And then I sent out the manuscript to a lot of great people, a bunch of travel writers. I think, you know, Jody Entenberg. Mm -mm. Legal Nomads. Um, she's in the whole WBS sphere, so I thought maybe you might. Um, but her, uh, Ryan Holiday, you know him? 
Yeah, that's a great person to look at your book. <laughs> yeah, so Ryan and his team were really instrumental in helping me craft the book, especially when, you know, on the second go, my literary folks were just like, yeah, the publishing house were just like, yeah, it needs more work. And I was like, but what work does it need? And so <laughs> I, I went to Ryan and Karen, I was like, okay, you help me. And they read it and they were like, here's the holes. And so that was really instrumental. And, you know, and they were really instrumental in getting me to open up and be more emotional because I'm not naturally that way. So they'd find a section where I sort of started to like really open up and, and lay it all out there, but then just stopped. And then you would say like, okay, keep going. That's awesome to have someone looking on the outside, like I, like Clay Hebert. <laughs> I, I don't, we don't know who the original source is, but you can't see a label from inside the jar. So it is yeah. helpful to have someone on the outside looking in, but there's also that protection of like, am, am I ready to share this with other people to get that feedback? You know, it's, it's a very constructive process and there's different times when we can feel really sensitive to getting that feedback or, but it sounds like you just kept going and like, nope, nope, nope. And, and got it. Like it's, it's going to be in hand soon. And I cannot wait to read it, especially knowing the, the process and the master classes and all of the pieces that you've incorporated into bringing this book to life and to the world. Right. I mean, I definitely watch, you know, tons of the literary master classes to be like, how does Judy Bloom do it? How does Aaron Sorkin make story? How does, you know, uh, R.L. Stein cast <laughs> characters? Like, let me look at it all. You know, I read The Hero's Journey. Uh, no, no, that's not what it's called. Yeah, it is The Hero, J Joseph Campbell's. Yeah, mm -hmm. that one. I read Story by Robert McKee. Like, I just read all these books about the process of writing and just devoured it as much because I was like, this is really difficult. Holy hell. Uh, <laughs> You know, and as the quote says, you can't see the label from inside the jar. You know, where do they always say, like, how do you write a great story? Put it down for a couple of weeks. And so sometimes it takes, you know, time. You have to write it and then, like, let it go to somebody else. So you can take a mental break from that story. So when it comes back, you can see it with fresh eyes. I love that. And before we wrap up, and I thank you so much for your time, how do you define home as a nomad? Ooh, that's really the central component of the whole entire book, actually. <laughs> so that's a very good question. If I give it away, will they read the book? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, now for me, well, if I tell you now, I mean, I really do give the ending of the book away. <laughs> um, but I will say that I think the idea of home as a singular place is in outdated construct in an age where everybody can be so mobile. Well, not everybody, but a large portion of the world can be a lot more mobile than they used to be. And so for me, home is sort of wherever I feel it's wherever I feel the most comfortable. It's not like home isn't a place. It's a feeling. And I know that's an abstract concept to wrap your head around and it doesn't really quite answer the question, but you know, it's, it's where I feel I belong. I think you answered the question beautifully. Great. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. A home is a feeling. And is there anything else that you'd like to share before we say goodbye? I would say one thing I would like to share before we say goodbye is that travel is a lot cheaper than you probably think it is. Thanks in part to the internet and the just breadth of information that you can find online about how to save money in destinations, travel deals that are going on right now, the ability to connect with locals, you know, all these services exist like Airbnb and Couchsurfing and, you know, tour operators that, you know, eat with where you can meet like with locals in their homes. Like it is not as expensive as you believe and once you go down the rabbit hole that is the internet you can find a lot of resources that will make your travel dreams a much quicker reality 
I love that so much. And one selfish question, you know, because we just started homeschooling our daughter and I'm planting the seed for world schooling for at least a year, whether that's her eighth grade year or, you know, whenever, what words of wisdom or where should I go to kind of go down that, that rabbit hole? For world schooling? Yeah. Um, I used to actually know a blog about this, but now I don't. Um, <laughs> Because I don't have kids, so I... Yeah, um, it's more of like the taking a year off. Like, you know, my business is is mobile and online. I coach, I lead retreats around the world. But my husband has, you know, he has a... He teaches music classes for kids called One Heart Music. And so he has a local following of families and full classes. And it's like, <gasps> to pause for a year, you know? Yeah, there's actually a website, The Wide Wide World dot com backslash rtw now they don't do it anymore because their kids are all grown but they do have a good blog roll of websites that are still updated yeah and just the mindset shift for people would that be inside your book to travel sooner than later yeah yeah so whereas the first book was the how of travel this is more about the what and the why i love it i'm so excited Thank you, Matt, for taking the time and sharing your wisdom from traveling the world and doing work that is of service to other people. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. It's been a good time. Thank you so much for your heart and attention and listening to Lead with Love. You can always get the links and resources mentioned in each episode over at leadwithlovepodcast.com so that you can build a sustainable business and live a creative life on your terms. If this message, Leading with Love, resonates with you and you want to take a stand for remembering that there are humans with beating hearts behind the numbers, I would love for you to subscribe so you never miss an episode and leave an honest review. It would mean the world to me and it also helps more people spread more love in the world, which we really, really need. I also love hearing from you. So as you're listening, take a screenshot, share your favorite takeaway, and tag me on Instagram and Facebook at Jada Selner. I really appreciate you, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.